I was there when you were drunk for the first time. I was yeah. <laughs> I feel like I see what why you're so much better than everyone. Dude, I get goosebumps just thinking about that process of like. Yeah, now to learn a trick, it goes months and months, if not even years, into learn new tricks. I was yeah. lucky enough to have. Max and Anton beating me up. Me and Anton were kind of like parents when we were going around and doing like, <laughs> well, we need to book this. Okay, let's do one for a bit. Like, Once you master it, you get beat down again because you crash on it and you need to master it again. So it's like this constant process of like. All right, I'm stuck in New Zealand. Uh, I'm in quarantine for 14 days straight. Today is day number six or seven, seven probably. Uh, Today is going to be a Pro Talks episode. I can't do any action videos, obviously, because I'm locked up here and I can't even go out of my room. So I'm going to make a full quarantine video for you guys so you understand what I'm going through and why and blah, 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 and uh, my setup and everything. So uh, we're going to do a Pro Talks episode. Emma Johnson is on the schedule today. I know a lot of you guys would love to hear some thoughts and some mindset and stuff from that guy because he's obviously the best bike rider in the world at the moment. He's such a talented guy. He's such a hard worker. And yeah, it's going to be sick to see what uh, he have in mind. I obviously know him from so many years. We grew up in Sweden together, not together, but like from the same country. And I can't, yeah, I kind of had to supervise him on his first couple of trips because he was too young and stuff like that. So we have a good relationship since years and years back. So it's going to be a good one. So I'm going to sit down with him now talk a little bit we'll see how long this video turns out to be but it's gonna be sick so yeah like and subscribe and uh yeah let's get to it all right so i'm sitting here with emil johnson i'm pretty sure like all of you guys already know who emil johnson is but for those of you that aren't really invested in biking because uh, i know there's some viewers that aren't this is emil johnson and i'm just gonna get straight to it he's the best bike rider that I've ever witnessed on the planet Earth. So just started there by doing, making you a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now we got it out there. So everyone knows uh, Emil is uh, the reigning champ of slope style at the moment. What do you got? Five, five in a row now. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, that was a very heavy start for you. I can imagine. But... <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, this is uh, Pro Talk episodes. We did a one with Anton, one with Alex, then the season started and we kind of just jumped away. So uh, we started off now, Emil agreed to hop on and we're going to talk about all and nothing, just old memories, the sport, uh, some other stuff. And yeah, you don't need an intro. Everyone knows who you are and where you come from and what you've done. Uh, but I just think it's quite fun. Like not a lot of people know like, actually like like i don't really know when i met you for the first time and i don't think people know like how you came up in the swedish scene i know people know how you came up in the world tour and stuff but in the swedish scene like i think i saw you like i don't even know how many years is it good question good question uh i can't recall were you at that indoor event in trolletan uh where yeah, martin yeah. won yeah yes so yes, I was I was very young back then. I was, I believe it was 2009 or something. So I was about 10 years old. <laughs> uh, but that Did was before that I knew. What? No, you... I didn't hit no, that no, jump. No. no, I was no, looking no. at it. I was like, there's no fucking way. And then, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I only remember knowing who Linus Sjöholm and Martin Soderstrom was. And that was the only two riders I knew. So everyone else was just, out of my knowledge really but I, I believe that was the first time I saw you on a bike in real life and then uh, I I would say Slope has been like the event where most Swedish riders has been able yeah, to man. connect and meet over the years and I believe that was the first time I really was able to actually get to know people more than just being on the sideline watching a competition go off and that was back in 2012 so it's about nine years ago wow well I, my first memory i have from you is that you came to my house to see my brother <laughs> and say my brothers <laughs> that's the first yeah. time like i was thinking about this yesterday i was like when did i meet him but i think that was because my brother and emil is the same age and they used to ride together kind of like both of you and felix were kind of on the you were the yeah like good going kids i'd say uh, like back in back then uh you guys were riding and you were doing some trips together i feel i think I, this is where i remember 
<laughs> so that was the first time. I remember just showing up with like big blue eyes because you face planted a couple of days. Oh my god! Yeah, that was the first time. I feel yeah. like I remember you. <laughs> like my whole side of the face was all swollen up because I like I slipped my pedals on a whip air like just a week after I learned it and fully smacked my face on the concrete. And yeah, I definitely scared a lot of people at school with that face for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean me and felix as he said were the same age it just sounded pretty hilarious when he said that i just showed up at your house uh <laughs> <laughs> well that was kind of because I, I like my brother sometimes is quite silent like as a person yeah. and he didn't tell me about it before i think and then you were there and then we went riding like everywhere around stockholm and up north and stuff because he, yeah. he doesn't know emily is from like five hours down from stockholm and i live in stockholm and then you now you live even two more hours up, right? <laughs> yeah, I I migrated yeah. from yeah, the migrated. West Coast, but <laughs> but yeah, no, it was an awesome experience. Got to see Capital Bike Park, which is an iconic spot in Sweden. And as a mm. kid, I remember like frothing that, looking at videos because the BMX Pro from Stockholm used to have sh- short bits on like the kids' TV during the summer of him riding around there. So I remember seeing that place and. And that was like at the pinnacle, like that's the sickest spot we have in Sweden. And then to be there a couple of years later was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, like we didn't have social media in the same way as we have now. So I guess we had like Swee Bikers and Pink Bike. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Like I, I, it's pretty funny how all this, like now social media is like a business. It's like all, not, all, not half, but like, or it could be like some writers are just, a pro rider because of social media so i mean it's quite random how like you even find people and like yo hey i want to come up ride your place i seen you're good at riding bikes it's yeah kind of, that i did as well i like a move went to martin anton and stuff like that we well i guess you martin was obviously your like everyone like he's the godfather of biking in sweden and europe i'd say probably did you already back then like look up to seminar and all those because i looked up to uh, like everyone the first two riders i looked up to was uh timo pritzel and lance mcdermott those the first two riders and i bet that was the only two riders i knew as well by that time and then later on uh two years later or so Ma- martin dropped his 2008 spring edit i think it was and i was like yeah. when i got to see him for the first time and then uh, i looked up to all swedish riders yourself anton was like the next up and comers that i really looked up to and i used to watch rideser tv which was a swedish based video show it has been a heavy influence from swedish writers for sure i don't really know where i got my i feel like the same as you kind of i brought all my like i looked up to martin linus john especially john yeah. you know john Hagman. he was the biggest like martin was obviously like the go in sweden uh but John was really like influential for me because and then I think it was like later on when we like at least m- me and Anton I'm pretty sure like started finding like Sam Pilgrim and Brandon and those guys but that was quite late anyways uh I want to toot your horn a little bit uh because since I don't know if people know when Emil came into the scene you kind of bursted into the scene like heavily you came from no event at all and then wildcard boom into diamond event and then boom next wildcard got that too into joyride boom pretty much and yeah yep. it's quite funny Mostly like sure. that, <laughs> that was a couple of trips though uh, i remember in the beginning you weren't even 18 when you came in <laughs> you know no. where i'm going with this because <laughs> uh... i me and anton obviously we were traveling, doing the same thing, going contest, contest, contest. And then Emil started hopping on with us and he was 17 years old. And in Sweden, when you're 17 years old, you aren't allowed to do everything. Like you don't even have a card that works for, as like, like credit do, card. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have that. <laughs> so me and Anton were kind of like parents when we were going around and doing like, <laughs> well, we need to book this. Okay, let's do one for Emil, like uh, stuff like that. Yeah. I remember you that. You make tell my parents to bank transfer you to like yeah. get money for flights because yeah. I couldn't pay it with my card, and it's like 
just yeah. this insane headache, honestly, as a kid growing up. But nowadays, but I think it's easier for the kids. But <laughs> yeah, where I want to go with all this, like when I met you, or like when we started hanging out a lot more, when we started traveling together, uh, you were such a like you never did anything else than ride bikes. You remember me and Anton told you all the time, "What have you done? You've never done anything." Like. <laughs> <laughs> well that's kind of why you are who you are and you're such like the best bike rider ever but i mean it's so have, have been super fun because you're now you are 22 i guess 20 yeah. yeah 22 so you start at 17 and all the, like that's a couple of years i mean that's five years and i've seen you go from literally five years ago you were a kid that didn't know anything yeah. pretty much about the world <laughs> now, yeah you were a very very like experienced and wise person i'd say you're like a very grown up and mature guy for being only 22 and i feel like that must have come from started so early and like you're just getting thrown into like let's go to canada let's go to new zealand let's do that let's do that let's do that and then you're 17 year old, years old well i was 19 when i started so at least i had two more years or like 18 19 but i feel like you you went so quick to now you're like I don't know you feel like so mature now compared to when i because like in my eyes for a long time yeah. i was like oh, he's just a kid he's just a kid yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i'm older course, than you obviously but <laughs> of course it's it's always gonna be feel like that growing up and then i don't know i've uh it's crazy to recall that it's now been five years since or four years oh it's it's five it's 2016 holy crap how fast everything flew by and uh, how much knowledge I've gotten just through riding bikes and all the experience that it brought to me. And then, like you said, I've growing up, I rode a lot of bikes and didn't really have a lot of like, even though I travel on my own and got into be independent in that sense, being out in the world on your own, it's, <laughs> it's a dangerous place to be if you don't know how to get around. So I was yeah. lucky enough to have, Max and Anson beating me up for everything I didn't know. <laughs> it's like, no, just giving me shit all the time. But I don't know. It's it was, sort of it was a proper, uh, like, uh, <laughs> you and know, Anton had you as our little, uh, little brother because we, yeah, you were a little. Uh, it's a hard upbringing. <laughs> no, yeah. <just> <laughs> yeah, he had a hard uh, yeah. youth biking world now. Yeah. But that's fun. That's what I mean. Like, because. Like when I look back and I was thinking, we have so many <laughs> fun things. I remember I even I was there when you were drunk for the first time. I was yeah, like, <laughs> I was <crying. laughs> there's so many fucked up things to happen over the years, but we're not gonna get too into that. Cause, but yeah, yes, some t- some stuff is worth <laughs> to keep private. <laughs> yeah. But there's definitely been some funny moments, and uh, yeah, yeah, we could keep that to ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's been fun. Like I'm, I, just, I keep remembering we, uh, 2016. I think I, I, I was competing for a lot of years before that. I've been competing for ten or eleven years soon, but I remember wow. for, yeah, dude, my body. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think 2016 was like the year when we. Wasn't that when we rented a car and we, we just stayed in Canada? Even for me, that was like a bit YOLO back then. We, you were 17. I was like 20. I didn't even get to rent the car with insurance. I needed to pay like 500 extra bucks for insurance. Yeah. just I was too young. What were we doing? We just flew to America. And you weren't even supposed to come on that trip either. You were in America, underaged. And then you're just like, well, I'm, I'm going to head out over to Canada as well and come with you guys. Kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, because I, I mean, I won the wild card. So I was like <laughs> looking at my money and I was like. <sighs> How good was that? Wasting when... this on flying back <laughs> home to fly back over again. And then you guys were going. I remember. I didn't go on my flight back home. <laughs> I just continued the trip with you guys and then did that. Yeah. It was quite crazy experience. Like how kind of my life just got so flipped upside down to from just being a kid in a way to be traveling and actually get to see Canada, which was like a childhood dream growing up, seeing British Columbia and also just Colorado and everything. Like, yeah, that was crazy. I mean, like 
it must have been crazy for you, especially like imagine just going like from just being a normal kid at home, kind of trying to be good at bike, riding bikes. And then all of a sudden you do good and someone hands you a stack of cash in your hand and then like <laughs> go fight that, go do that, go do that. And then a year later, just like everyone's dragging on in you and like agencies, like for those of you who doesn't know me and Emil have the same agency as well. Uh, we got the same agents that are helping yeah. us with stuff management uh so and then them the contracts and all of that just from one year like kind of flipped everything around it's quite because you were 18 when you signed everything right or not even no i was i signed with the majority of my sponsors between age 17 and before age 18 everything kind of happened at the end of 2016 I got involved with the C3 project, which I still can't believe that that managed to happen, at least not that early. And then just a year later from my first Jura debut, I got on Red Bull. And then, yeah, it's, it was a very fast process, everything. Uh, very surreal, very surreal to even think back on how short of a period it actually was. But it's crazy how you excelled then, like as well. Like it's crazy how you went from like being an up and coming rider, and then we were competing and stuff like that. And uh, that was when people didn't know that Emil Johansson was about to fuck Slope Style up. <laughs> that was like we were still all of the. Well, I was in, like quite in there then and did like all the podiums and stuff. And then one year later, boom, Emil comes out, and we were like, "What the fuck? <laughs> Where did everything come from?" So that winter, that's the big mysterium. That's the only thing I don't really get in my head. Like, cause I get now, cause I see you train and stuff and I see how you ride when you're at dome and stuff. And but we didn't my... have that back then either, which is. No, I know. But like, I see how you ride and use your time and I get why you are as good as you are. Cause efficiency is obviously key when it comes to riding and you're very smart with your training, I'd say. Uh, but that winter, like to jam, everything you did into that like like all the things you learned over a winter is just pff, to me from being just a green kid like to come out and you look like a veteran doing new tricks that no one ever thought about doing kind of <laughs> yeah quite crazy <laughs> Uh, that, that was that was the that was even that. more weird to me now when i saw you do a world's first in canada i was like oh Obviously, he did. Like, <laughs> it's kind of like that now, at least. But that back then was the first time when everyone was like, whoa, okay. Kind of, I'd say. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was an action packed winter. Lots of riding, lots of chilly days in that indoor spot we had. And I don't know. It just escalated in a way that it's like one thing led to the next. And all of a sudden, you take like four steps in one and then. Yeah. I think that's also something that people don't really understand, like how much logic there is behind biking and learning tricks. A lot of people just think it's going out and do trying a hundred times in a phone, but it's also like, as you said, you can jump four steps instead of just one, 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 if you have the right idea of a trick and how you're going to go about access and stuff of everything. Uh, so I think that's like, that's what you, that's where I feel like, well, I obviously know quite a lot about biking myself. So I feel like I see what, why you're so much better than everyone. Cause I see you, you have everything figured out in your brain with the access points and everything. And I th feel like that's like, yeah, I think that's what makes you a very better, much better rider than everyone. Like, cause you know how to jam everything in, you get, you're so good at get quality airtime compared to a normal rider. So you're just standing there like shoo, shoo, <laughs> sort of so like and when people are struggling to get into the right lean and stuff out of the kickers and like that but you're just like i don't know it's obviously down to like repetition and hours and hours and hours and hours of training but i feel like from my own calculation i think it's because of that i don't know that was just my thought i had about it <laughs> uh, i don't think it's a dumb thought it's definitely like it is a mind game uh, yeah. to a yeah. big extent 
not only when it comes to competitions, but also a lot when it comes to learning to like get like be an expert at a trick and then be able to master it. And then once you master it, you get beat down again because you crash on it and you need to master it again. So it's like this constant process of like learning and relearning. And then after a certain amount of time, you're at least able to know a trick to a certain extent. So you at least have the basics and usually doesn't just come and go out of no reason, but uh, sometimes they do. They just come by for a bit, get away, and then you don't see them for a yeah. couple of years, and then yeah. they come back. Yeah, and that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's just kind of how it goes for everyone. Uh, but it is yeah. pretty crazy how like the body has a muscle memory that is able to, through training, be able to do the exact right thing at the exact right moment uh to end up doing the same thing or like make you end up on the wheels like when you actually start thinking about it you could go on for hours just thinking about how it actually works and it just doesn't really make sense that you could no. come into a bigger jump and just because of the gyro effect of the jump that slows the spin down enough for you to almost pop as on your regular jump at home but even though it's twice as big, you don't end up upside down. Like you just yeah. have this built in, I don't know. <laughs> That's also a crazy thing that I think gets overlooked a lot of times is that you're on, like you manage to qualify for a competition, but when you show up, you don't even have half the trick you want, half the tricks you want to do. Like you haven't spun a drop, you haven't flipped a step down and just throwing yourself out there and doing that in practice uh, takes a lot of mental strength and one or two screws loose, I guess, to be able to <laughs> see Just the logic of the, yeah, that it, it is. Make more sense, more though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, for example, I think I'd rather like, let's just take uh, well, let's go with Poland. Now the big jump there in the beginning was wait too long and random yeah. i i i didn't straight at it once i just flipped it every time because i felt like that's more safe that doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense <laughs> <laughs> like i didn't hit it before i, I just flipped it first go yeah. like how does that make sense how do i know how much to rotate well obviously people are going to say well from doing that for this many years but how do we know how to like how do your body know because every jump is different and all the angles are different, the speed, gyro forces, everything. How can our bodies adapt so much that they're doing? Especially with like flips, in my opinion. Like, just, like honestly, I think it's when it comes to that stuff, it's a lot just unconscious stuff. Like you you can't possibly like adjust in a lift. Like there's there's no way for your conscious mind to be like pop less, you know, or like it's not like you can go, this jump is twice as big, so I'm just gonna pop 50%. Like there's not no. such a thing. So like when you're in the lift, you kind of feel the force and that force gives you a fingertop feel of like, okay, this must be it. But I don't know, over time, I got to realize that sometimes, honestly, like you said, when you want to flip the jump first go, well, if you're in a flip, you at least could open up, close. You could do all these things to at least make it yeah. less dangerous as long as you get around but <laughs> that's where it's a bit tricky because i mean yeah, exactly. flip, it's flip and it's yeah on big stuff it's if you go down you go down pretty hard and there's no way around it it's a very very heavy sport in that aspect like if you screw up on a crankworks course you're gonna most likely get injured like yeah. that's kind of what's well that's at least my take because that's what's happened to me basically every time i've crashed i've broken somewhere but even just like as you said like if people knew how dumb we sound when we ask like if i would go to flip a super steep jump that's obviously a bit more scary than a mellow and long jump in my opinion uh, uh, then we i could like ask let's take you for example like i would say like yo emil have you flipped that one and you say yes and i would say oh is it how is it just go slow 
And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then I go. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> if people heard that, I would be like, you're going to do a flip of a 10 meter jump. Like, what What do you? Well, we're going to jump a little bit uh, yeah. from just uh, physics and our brains being tired <laughs> of thinking about biking. Yeah. <laughs> Science. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to be, that's what we're sitting here. We're supposed to be the best bike riders in the world, but we still don't get it. We still don't get it how it works but anyways uh well you obviously have a shit ton of wins you have a lot of uh, podiums you have a lot of uh, uh you're a decorated rider to say well like why like this is a cheesy and normal question i'd say but what like what what do you what do you want to achieve where do you want to go what's your goal kind of like what's your motivation sort of uh what do you want to I mean, you are considered being the best rider that ever did it when it comes to being slope style. Uh, so, like, yeah, what is it? Um, can you not with with like when you already winning, winning, winning five times in a row? I would be bored. Like, if <laughs> as soon as, when I was, I got ranked very, very high. Well, one once, and after that, I was like, well, well now what? 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 What am I doing now? How can you still be like hungry for it? Because I got kind of bored. And that's why I kind of fell off a bit. Because it's hard. I don't get any motivation if I'm. I get bored. How do you do? I don't know. It's it's a very interesting question. Uh, something I ask myself every now and then. What keeps me going? It all comes back to down why I fell in love with writing in the first place, and that that is to like be able to progress and excel as a person on a bike uh even though like you say i've have i've had good results and so on it's uh, not really the wins that keeps me going it's not really the results uh that are on the paper it's more the results that come from within and i think that that's what keeps me going because then which is the crazy thing when you think about it it's it's a never-ending circle it is Definitely. I used to be all about results, like completely. I, I used to be when, was that was when I was just chasing results, doing that, learning tricks to do better at contests, do that, that, that. And that's, I feel like you're so good at like, just, you just want to do your run. You don't really care about that. And that's kind of what I've switched it, switched to now. Now my motivation is that I want to land contest runs. And you know, the feeling if when you work, your ass off for a long time and then you land the run and you're like oh you know yeah. that's the best feeling that's what that's why i still do this shit like to just land the run and feel like you know that it's indescribable yeah. to for people to understand what that feeling is uh but yeah, I, yeah. dude i get goosebumps just thinking about that process of like going through that mental state and being able to accomplish something you set out to do. I mean, yeah. you set out these vague and like a kind of absurd goals sometimes that you're like, I want to get this in there. And then at a contest, you have like wind, rain. There's oh. so many factors that balance into it. I guess there's, it must be so many factors and we can talk about this for ages, but basically it's because you want to do some things in your runs kind of. So basically it's, you want to lay down what you know you can do. I know you're saving stuff as well, like in your runs. You can do, <laughs> like. <laughs> but uh, are you like? Well, I'm gonna bring this one out. Oh, I'll do that one for this. Out of that. <laughs> uh, to a certain extent, that's kind of how it is. Uh, it it would be foolish to put all the cards on the table at once. I mean, any sport, it's quite selfish like that's just how it is like my performance is all about me 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 but what i what i've seen with other riders that have been able to excel at their sports is that they're able through being a bit like me 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 want to progress as a person they want to exceed they're able to touch people outside they're able to inspire and if you really have tunnel vision on like just being an ex dream sport athlete or just an athlete of any sort you're you need to be selfish to be able to excel at that sport and it sometimes could feel to spend all this time on doing something just for you to progress but when you look at the bigger perspective you're able to 
inspire people and that's also one thing that drives me is that like knowing that what i do on my bike now knowing that what you do on your bike now is going to inspire the next generation to do the exact same and then one up us and come up with even more new crazy tricks for us to just able to enjoy and see and that that's just exciting when you think about it that like i i i I honestly can't wait uh to watch where the sport is in 20 years it's uh, even just what looking back 10 years from now like yeah it's it's insane how where the level is at at the moment no i definitely agree with you on that when it comes to like like i went into a pretty dark place and i was like what like that's what i said when i fell off and kind of lost motivation for doing contests for a while but that was with my injuries and shit but like what's the purpose why am i doing this well like it's just like it's just a contest who cares like but then when I realized, well, this is actually like when I do a contest, when I do good and when people see that they get inspired from it, then that brings out the whole new generation. And we're the people that are forming the next generation, the future of our sport, yeah. sort of. And that's kind of also now I've shifted from being like, I just want to do that. I want to be number one. I want to do that. I want to do that. Because that is super selfish, as you say, like, but it's still going to be selfish. It's a sport where we focus on ourselves to be the best striders. But at the same time, if we could also focus on bringing up a new generation or helping them and like inspiring them, then it makes more sense in my eyes to do it. Yeah. Then if we would just, just to collect a bag of money contracts and some trophies, like what, like what's, we're going to do with that when we're, it's, uh, (laughs) I think selfish or like selfishness or stuff like that gets looked at as something negative a lot of times. I mean, if you're doing an individual sport, it's not like they are not nice people, you know, it's just that they want to, like, you need to be selfish to excel at an individual sport and in any sport. The- at the same time, if you're doing an individual sport, you're the one gonna, that are going to make it happen. No one's going to train yeah. for you. No one's going to help you out. No one's going to do that, that, that. You got to have to be selfish. You got to have to prioritize yourself at all times if you want to make it up to being one of the best riders in the world. Like that's, that's the reality. Yeah. That goes for any sport, any athlete. I don't know. It's just such a deep topic. I feel like yeah. we could talk about it for ages. It's a deep one. Oh, now I started thinking a lot. It hurts in my brain. no i mean i think it makes sense when it might like what what i i have a big motivation from uh, a guy called tyson fury the boxer he made a like super good quote and said like uh, like what am i like why do i care about all my trophies all of that 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 because what what is that gonna matter when i'm dead like it's not gonna matter but what's gonna matter is that he inspired millions and millions of kids to go and start boxing or doing yeah. that or get invested in the sport that's kind of what i see as the big like greatness to be honest and i think that's achieved in so many different ways like you for example being the best contest rider we've seen like in years and then we have let's say fabio Wimmer who does it through his videos and then we have all these athletes that are doing it in so many cool ways and uh yeah, it's just what I'm trying to say, I feel like, is that I realized later on, uh, and I wish I realized it when I was younger, is that it made a huge difference for me when I realized that all of this goes into that and not only for my own trophies, my own achievements. It, it's actually a bigger purpose and it's going to help out the sport in the future. And do you, do you like, okay, this is going to be like, obviously you have to say yes now. Otherwise, you're always not. <laughs> Do you like slope style where it's at? And like, what, what's like, do you think it needs improvement? What do you like, or do you think our sport is developed enough? I compare it a lot to like other sports and I see room for improvement everywhere, but it's also an insanely good sport and I love it. So I don't know. It is a very, very hard question. Uh, it's 
crazy to look at the progression the sport has done within, like we said before, just the last 10 years. If we're able to get more Crown Crooks events all over the world, we're moving toward something really good because due to COVID and stuff, it's everything been so slimmed down. It hasn't been like it used to be. But I think slope style is good in the way that we have a course that is isn't like BMX where they show up to the Olympics and they've already been riding the course before they even show up. Uh, that, that, that's insane. Like they, they have when stamps. we show up, it's like and I and I think that's kind of a beauty in it as well is that the features are never the same uh, with slope style. It's uh, the dirt is different. The speed is different. You, you need to be master at so many different things to be able to perform at a slope style course. You need to be a perfectionist in all levels of just speed management, pumping, uh, how hard to push in the lift, like just knowing all these things to be able to get down the course safely when you're trying to do the gnarly stuff you could do on the course as well. And also to show up at any any course that you haven't been practicing on for the last year and be able to very fast get comfortable is you, you need a whole nother level of riding confidence and riding capabilities to be able to do that. If you would take anyone in slope style and put them on their home spot and let them do their best shit, I think a lot of riders would be able to be at a very different spot compared to where they end up when they do a contest. Because at a contest, there's a new course and all these factors that at home is more easily dealt with uh gets pretty big no that, that's like that's a thing we usually joke about like that if you pick a kid at your home spot if you have an airbag mild jump whatever you could probably like half of the crank works field could probably be beat by that kid just from doing tricks but then when you jump onto a crank works course it's a whole different sport like people yeah. don't understand what you say how much you need to master and be good at at a crank works course and i mean what you mentioned bmx have standards in uh, like they have the same courses as they have when they show up at a contest and we have different angles of everything we have different dirt we have different landings we have different gaps uh i think that's all honestly a better way to measure who's the better rider of the day because that just shows who can adapt more to the situation yeah. and being a versatile rider compared to just like, well, we're going to have a nine foot quarter with this angle. Uh, it's going to be exactly as the one you have in your backyard. Uh, how are you going to measure that? It's just going to be up to who have the better airbag and resi place at home. Yeah. Pretty much. And yeah. me growing up, I always looked up to the riders that could like drop in on any set of trails or anything and then just look comfortable. Like after just yeah. like almost first lap, be able to like, look really comfortable it's like when you think about it it's like a, like even though it's just a jump it's a whole different thing every time you approach it and whenever you hit a new jump like to be able to adapt the speed like we spoke about it before how it's like you drop in and it's like yeah dude you will feel it don't think about it and you're like drop in and you just feel it like to be able to have that sense of feeling and understanding for the bike takes a lot of experience and getting fucked up a lot of times. <laughs> I have to cry. Doing mistakes. So many times. I mean, yeah, yeah. When like my friend came to Crankworks uh, for the first time this year, he was like, "What on earth is this? It's so big." Yeah. On the screen at home, it looks so small, and I'm like, "What is it? Oh yeah, it is big." But I usually say in my course walks and stuff like that, "This is just stupid what we're doing because it's so <laughs> massive <laughs> if you think about it." But yeah, but it's I don't know. Back, back to where slope style is going, I, I think it's a very interesting topic because there's there's many ways we could route it. There's many ways it could be. When it comes to jumps, just jumps in general, like you could have a jump that gives you a lot of quality air time or you could have a jump that is just massive. And when you have a lot of gyro effect, generally just a bigger massive jump doesn't really add to any trick difficulties no. like it doesn't give us any bigger tricks it's just like yeah dude he gained two meters more airtime and it's like on a screen at home obviously that very big jump 
could look somewhat bigger in comparison to everything else. Not even uh, much. <laughs> not much. And it doesn't necessarily allow for progression on the tricks. Yet we have this balance of like just progression on the tricks and we have the balance of progression as a technicality aspect yeah. where it's like he's able to adapt this thing and yeah i don't know yeah no definitely okay a random question just one quick uh answer i want if you could be any other type of athlete what would it be Oof. Uh, one of these hard questions again surfer surfer yeah yeah uh, I'm either yeah i think that would be the sickest because they're like out in the water and i and i grew up on the west coast like i always loved but imagine loved how cold it can be though hmm? imagine how cold it can be yeah of course but yeah uh, i mean I, like the cheesy answer would be to say i want to be what i am today but like let's just face it it's quite like a lot of things that goes into ride bikes we need a perfect course we need that 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 yep. that what i would like is simplicity i want to would like to be a skater just take your board yeah your comfy ass shoes no protection and <laughs> just go out and just skate yeah and you shit for four hours in a row on a rail sounds yeah. awesome <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's probably painful as uh, but this is painful as well what we're doing so I try, yeah I don't know. like when you've been doing a sport for a while even though you still appreciate all of it it's normal so that's why like whenever i go do something other than biking i could find joy in something so much less dangerous or something <laughs> so different than what i find joy in when it comes to biking just because i haven't been able to push that bar anything it was easy in the beginning when it was like, oh, I have, I just hit this jump. I want to do one hander. And it's like, oh, could I do a suicide no hander? And it's like, you could take like yeah, four yeah. new things and you jump, you're like, best day ever. But when I'm like doing a truck to double down with and I'm like, want to do something harder, then it's like, holy shit. Like, it yeah, goes, it's gonna, like, it just it's gonna be so day. much harder. <laughs> it's so yeah. much harder. Yeah, now to learn a trick, it goes months and months, if not even years, into learn new tricks yeah it's like it's so it's so different from when we were kids and we could be like learn oh, i learned five tricks today okay cool <laughs> yeah that's why that's why also people that know me back home they're always telling me that i i need to like stop doing sport because i do sports 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 that's because it's so much fun to just learn new stuff like i play paddle golf do that 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 yeah. every every sport that is some one of my friends are doing i want to try it and do it that's just because i love the feeling when we did as kids just like learning learning yeah. learning learning uh because now it doesn't come that quick and easy anymore it's uh, so much more you have great. to start something new then i guess <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no but i mean it's just fun to mix it up and learn yeah. new stuff. no but it's yeah it's i feel as like a lot of things you could learn in different sport translates over just in general to your life and then just to help you out to exceed in riding and like it's crazy to see how everything is so connected it is for sure i feel like we talked a lot we this was longer than i thought so we'll see how long this episode is gonna be <laughs> yeah. but, uh... Thanks a lot for chatting a little bit with me and uh, for everyone that is watching. If you're still watching this episode, you are a true, true fan of me and Emil. Because <laughs> <laughs> you listen to a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it was good chatting, getting, like, uh, getting a bit deep with you and uh, hearing your thoughts up and takes on stuff. Uh, we usually discuss quite a lot of these things that we already discussed today. But <laughs> yeah, but that's in private. And yeah. Yeah. Kind of sick get the thoughts out there a bit yeah it's cool then people uh, got to know a bit more about you people are gonna appreciate this for sure and people are gonna be stoked and you're probably gonna be made into either a meme or a motivational video by someone <laughs> <laughs> yeah can't wait for the meme. every time there's a meme yeah it's gonna be yeah. me. 
definitely. Pin memes. Yeah, yeah. no. Good chat. Awesome. <laughs>